Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Laren, and um, I'm going to start the slideshow in just a moment, but wanted to say hi with my face first. Um, and I've only been with Atten about four months, so I'm new here, but have been working with Backdrop for about seven years and uh, with Drupal for uh, many years before that. Um, I think I started in uh, Drupal 5, and I've been working with nonprofits and uh, educational groups and their websites for about 20 years. To you, Jen. Sure. Uh, I'm Jen Lampton. Hello, everybody. Um, I have uh, 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 been doing web development since the late 90s. <laughs> so I've had a lot of experience in that. Um, professionally, I'm an independent contractor, so I run my own business. I'm often um, the only person taking care of a website, which means that the projects I work on are a little smaller. I do sometimes on teams where I can take on larger projects when there are more of us to take care of them. Um, of those projects, I primarily want to work on Backdrop these days. Uh, I've been working back with Backdrop for almost 10 years now. It started in, working on it in 2013, and here we are 10 years later. Uh, before that, I'd been working on Drupal for seven years at the time I started working on Backdrop. So now I've been working with Backdrop for longer than I've been working with Drupal before I started Backdrop, which is kind of mind boggling. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to share some of what we know. All right, give me just a second here. Okay, um, so we've titled this Everything You Want to Know About Backdrop CMS, but are afraid to ask. And in the in the event that we mistitled it and you have a question that we didn't cover, there should be time at the end if you're not afraid to ask it. Um, this is going to be mostly the who, what, when, where, and why about what Backdrop is, uh, some of the differences and changes that have happened from Drupal 7, not as much a, um, a training about how to use it, but we may touch on a little bit um, on some of those things as well. Um, so we kind of did the intros already, so I'll skip through these pages quickly and uh, pass it on to Jen to talk about how this all began. Sure. So um, uh, I have been an active contributor to the Drupal community for a really long time. Um, I was on uh, the usability team for a while. I worked on usability studies. I got really involved in, um, in particular, how to make Drupal easier for people to learn, primarily because at the time I was um, working as a trainer. So I was writing training material and teaching people how to use Drupal. And through all of that, uh, we kept running into problems with the theme layer, trying to teach people how to write themes for Drupal seemed to be harder than necessary. Uh, and so there were a whole bunch of people in the Drupal community that got together and was like, how can we make this easier for people to learn in the future? And we spent um, a couple of years working on uh, various different ideas on how to do that and landed on Twig as a theme engine. And I ended up being a sort of an unofficial initiative lead in early Drupal 8, trying to get Drupal 8 converted from PHP template, which is what we were using in Drupal 7, to Twig. And I spent a lot of time like thinking about how the system works, how to refactor them, how to simplify things, how to remove levels of complexity, how to make it just sort of make a little more intuitive sense to people without needing necessarily education on it in order to figure out how to use it. Um, and I got very bogged down in the front end. Um, and I'm not a front end developer. I mean, I do it, I'm not very necessarily great at it, uh, but it was something that I felt really passionate about because I, I felt like most people who came to Drupal to become a developer sort of started in the theme layer because that seemed like an easy place to dip your toe in and that needed to be an inviting place for people to start. And through the you know year and a half or two that we were just cranking out changes to the theme system, um, there was a lot of changes that were going on in Drupal 8 in the back end that I wasn't necessarily aware of. And when it came to the time where I was like, oh, okay, you know, let me write some presentations on how to move to Drupal 8. And I realized that I had some sites I was working on and they had module changes that I had to work on. And I took a look at what was involved. I was like, whoa, this is the opposite of everything I've been working on for the last, I don't know how many years, like this is now more complicated and it's taking more time and it's less intuitive and why, 
why is this happening? Um, and there was one DrupalCon where a whole bunch of us came together to sort of talk about the current state of Drupal 8. And this was, you know, well before Drupal 8 was out and try and figure out how to make it much better. Um, and uh, we're like, well, you know, it doesn't look great right now, but you know, it's not done yet. There's more room for improvement. And if we really don't like where it goes, we can always fork it, ha ha, open source. And at the time it was more sort of just a, you know, a crazy comment to sort of make us feel better about the current state of things. Um, but uh, months later, we realized it wasn't getting better in a lot of ways it was getting worse. And um, it seemed like it was causing a split for our audiences um, where Drupal had called itself, you know, a, a product that's for everyone. And it started to feel like that was no longer the case, especially for me. A developer that works on smaller projects for smaller companies with smaller budgets. Um, I tend to do what I call like long term relationships with websites where I'll build one and I continue working on them, you know, decades into the future. I have Drupal sites now that I log into a we'll backdrop. Now I log into them and they say you've been a member for 15 years. <laughs> That's the same website I've been taking care of that whole time. Uh, and those those customers, they go through every upgrade right and every time i do an upgrade for them they're like okay how much is it going to cost what am i going to get out of it and a lot of times like what you're going to get out of it is keeping up to date with the software and there isn't any other like business advantage for them to make this investment into their site and so as the costs of upgrades got more expensive from five to six from six to seven um they're having a harder time with that cost. And I looked at what was going to be required to move these sites that I've been taking care of for decades into Drupal 8. And I was like, I can't, I can't take this back to my customers and offer it to them and still feel good about it at the end of the day. I can't, I can't now ask them to justify the investment in making that move. And as I was thinking about that, um, my now husband uh, also runs a business that is software as a service based on a Drupal module. And he was looking at what it was going to cost to take him to move his service from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 as a business owner. And he's just like, there's no way this makes sense anymore. Like as someone who's running a business who's supposed to be making money off of this, the amount of the investment I would have to make just to stay where I am in terms of the feature set he's delivering. Um, was going to cost him more money than that business was earning. And so he also took a look at all the changes that were required to move from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 at the time and thought, you know what? Let's just, you know, create something on GitHub and play around with it and see what backdrop might look like. Um, back then, we didn't know it was going to be called backdrop yet. <laughs> um, what it might look like as a fork. Um, and a couple of people uh, found the project on GitHub because guess what, if you're a prominent Drupal, Drupal developer and start trying to fork the Drupal project, it doesn't stay quiet for very long. Um, and so then we had to sort of go back and be like, okay, hold on, let's like write down what we're thinking and why we're here and where we ended up. So um, it, this came from a place where, uh, you know, Nate and I love Drupal. We, you know, spent, I don't know, countless hours like investing our own time into this product because we feel like it does a really good thing for the world. And when we felt like the Drupal that we knew and loved was no longer going to be a fit for what we wanted it to do, we wanted a Drupal to still be available to those markets. So that, those are people like him who are working on software as a service platforms, people like me who are working for smaller customers who still need a solution. And so um, that's why we decided to sort of continue the previous Drupal um, and move it forward in a way that will be better for our uh, particular audiences. So Nate and I were very heavily invested in how uh, Drupal core development happened. Uh, we were able to sort of look at where Drupal 8 landed and said, okay, so if this is where the Drupal development process will naturally take the software, um, if we're going to move in a different direction, we need to figure out how to not do exactly the same thing, right? Because all, all of our experience wasn't doing things the way Drupal did. And so in order to do that, we sat down and we thought about, you know, what is it that's important to us? What is it that we want to guide our project forward? And we came up with these uh, principles that you can see here. 
Um, if you want to read more about them, they're all available on the philosophy page for backdropcms.org. Uh, but we sat down and we're like, okay, so what? why are we here? What is it that we're doing that's going to be different from Drupal? And we wrote down, um, number one, it's getting too hard to update. Like every time you have to do an upgrade, it's too painful people, for people. And so that was our number one priority was to make easier updates. So that means that we're going to start valuing backwards compatibility, where in Drupal, backwards compatibility was up previously maintained for your data, but not your code. Starting in Drupal 8, it was no longer maintained for your data. We just had to go the other way. We're like, well, now it's going to be important for your code in Backdrop as well. So we're going to try and figure out how to support backwards compatibility. Uh, number two, simplicity. This came from the increased complexity in Drupal. We felt it was too complicated and hard for people to understand without official education. We wanted it to be more simple, more intuitive. So we went the opposite way with that. Focus. Um, there were a lot of features that were introduced into Drupal that less than 1% of Drupal sites were actually using. We felt like we're going to try and simplify our product and make sure that most of the features that are in core anyway end up uh, being used by 80% or so of sites that are using Backdrop so we can sort of make the, the feature set there um, really robust, but also they should be the most important features. Um, and then extensibility is really important, right? Because if you are one of those 1% of sites, you still need to be able to do what you need to do with the software. And so, you know, Drupal wouldn't be what it is without its thousands of modules. And we need to keep that same um, atmosphere and environment for a backdrop. And so backdrop also needs to be easily extended and customized through contributed code and custom code. Security is something that's really important because um, you know Drupal's always had a reputation for being a very secure platform. We wanted to maintain that in Backdrop as well and say that's yes, it's, it's, you know that's why we're one of the reasons why we're here to start with. It's something that we're going to keep um, pushing forward, moving forward. And performance came out of a, um, a sort of a problem that emerged in the Drupal seven cycle where you started seeing people have requirements for Drupal specific hosting platforms because the amount of resources that Drupal sites required were starting to you know, uh, exceed what you could get on like a shared hosting plan. And so with Backdrop, we're like, we need to bring that back down and we need to make sure that people can host a Backdrop site on any platform. It needs to be less resource intensive. And if we can do that by refactoring the code and making it run more efficiently, then we should do that. Uh, releasing on time. This is something we've done since day one in working on Backdrop. The Drupal community has also recently <laughs> realized that releasing on time is really valuable. They do that too. We both use um, semantic versioning now for standard um, uh, release schedules that you see all over open source development. Uh, but yeah, every every release is scheduled for a specific date. And if features aren't ready by that date, they don't get in, but the software still gets released on time. And that makes it really easy for developers to plan around when they need to block off time to work on that. It makes it easy for people who are running sites to be able to budget for when they need to reserve resources for updates and stuff like that. And it makes the whole, um, uh, the whole cycle a lot more regular and easy for people to keep up with. And freedom, obviously, uh, you know, Part of the reason we were able to fork is because Drupal's open source license, we have inherited that license, and uh, we believe that it's important for people to be able to continue to fork and do what they want with the software. We actually already have a fork of Backdrop. It's called Silkscreen. Uh, we love it. It's it's really beneficial for us. And um, yeah, of course, being able to uh, keep it free is important as well, because we want everyone who needs a website to be able to do it with Backdrop at a cost. So um, just to uh, put a cap on all of that background, um, the, the backdrop mission statement uh, is pretty short. It says backdrop CMS enables people to build highly customized websites affordably through collaboration and open source software. Um, and so when I read that, um, I, I pull out a number of, of things from that one sentence. I, I see um, a commitment to empowerment and usability to to enable people to do these things um, uh, flexibility and power uh, highly customized websites uh, affordability um, for uh, you know smaller medium-sized groups that that uh, may not be able to to uh, redo their website completely every few years and want something that that's um, uh, a bit easier on budget um, and then the teamwork and open source piece of things um, as well. 
um, is uh, is critical to the uh, the mission here. Um, so I wanted to also talk a little bit about who this is for, and and Jen touched on that uh, in the in the personal story that she shared. Um, I'm going to share a little bit from my my background on how I became introduced to the project as well. Um, but first of all, from the the official um, audience section of the Backdrop CMS website, um, the particular target audience is small to medium sized businesses, nonprofits, educational institutions, um, companies, and organizations who are in need of a comprehensive website for a reasonable price. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting uh, thing for a project to to focus in that tightly. Um, and uh, you know, Drupal is great and does amazing things. And for the, the the companies that that and the organizations that use it, it's it's really powerful and amazing. But there there are groups um, who can't afford it um, for one reason or another. And and. Um, the mission of Backdrop is to kind of meet the needs of those organizations without um, without them having to leave the Drupal family, so to speak. I, I still think of uh, Backdrop as part of the Drupal family, and um, um, I also think the the values that are listed on the Backdrop website also point to another interesting uh, shift of focus um, in that. Uh, in a little bit of maybe of a reversal of, of what you might expect, the the, the uh, Drupal kind of has become known as like a developer's tool that developers can make do anything. Um, but it, uh, at least historically, has been thought of as um, a little more developer friendly than user friendly. I think that's changing over time as well. But Backdrop specifically values the needs of the editor and architect first, and then the needs of the contrib developer and then the needs of the core developer, um, which I think is a, it's a interesting to call out that particular focus. Um, um, and I think that, that Backdrop stands on its own um, as a content management system, but at the moment with the Drupal 7 end of life looming, um, there's a particular soft spot in my heart and the particular focus uh, on groups who, for whatever reason, are unable or unwilling to move to um, Drupal 8, 9, or 10, um, because the transition to Backdrop can be so relatively seamless and, and, uh, and easy in comparison to um, uh, moving to a more modern Drupal. Um, the chart here is one that many people will have seen before. Uh, it shows the usage of uh, Drupal over time. And the, the the big red stripe in the middle is Drupal 7 usage. And you can see, um, even after all these years since um, Drupal 8, 9, and 10 have been released, there's still, uh, I would say, easily half of Drupal sites are probably running on uh, Drupal 7 um, still. So um, hopefully, you know, some of those will, will make their way to Drupal 10. Uh, some of them may migrate to other platforms. But I think there's a there's a big space for a lot of them to to uh, discover and move into to backdrop. Um, the the personal aspect of how I came to backdrop is um, I mentioned that I've been working with Drupal five six seven um, and primarily with small to medium sized nonprofits educational groups so on and so on um, and as Drupal eight was released began to uh, move them to Drupal eight and very quickly realized that most of these groups uh, sort of wanted to hit the brakes and, and say, let's let's reassess. This isn't kind of what we, you know, this isn't what we thought it was going to be. This isn't what we need. Uh, um, and I happened upon Backdrop. It, it, I hadn't uh, hadn't heard of it before. And uh, it very quickly, I, I realized that most of the groups I had been working with at the time um, much more naturally fit into the backdrop path than, than uh, Drupal 8, 9, 10. Um, mostly because of smaller teams, smaller budgets, um, and so on, but also because um, you know they, they were largely happy with their websites and they wanted to keep those websites going. They didn't want to start from scratch um, and that, that sort of thing. So I was very, very glad to discover it and to dive right into the community. Um, and uh, and help those groups move on to to backdrop. 
So as I kind of hinted at, um, if you if you have a Drupal 7 site in particular, um, some of the reasons why you might want to consider backdrop um, is if your site, you know, basically does what you need at the moment, you're mostly happy with it, you may, you may want to redesign it or refresh the design, you may not. Um, you may not have a budget to start from scratch and you'd like to sort of continue from where you are right now. Um, the uh, backdrop community has has proven that um, backwards compatibility doesn't mean that you can't have ongoing improvements. Um, it just means that the things that 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 have been working in the past should continue working by and large. Um, and you, know, you can also have ongoing improvements as you go forward. Um, and uh, I think the uh, the attention to the administrative experience compared to Drupal 7 uh, is something that people who first come to Backdrop are really uh, impressed with. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit more uh, on a future slide here, but um, if you don't have a real need to, to rebuild um, or, or migrate, uh, you, you may want to uh, strongly consider Backdrop as an option. And also if the, the Backdrop philosophy resonates, um, I think that's, uh, that's um, Kind of some key reasons why Drupal 7 site owners um, could be interested. So there's a lot of things that have changed in Backdrop uh, over the last 10 years, um, but there are th two things that I think are really different from Drupal 7 that um, people who are new to Backdrop um, sometimes love and sometimes struggle with learning. Uh, my favorite is layouts. Um, we're going to talk about it a little more later, but essentially we took uh, what was the panels module in Drupal 7 and put that in Backdrop, but they gave it a new user interface that it was a little less cumbersome for people to use. Uh, and we allowed that to control the entire layout of the page. So rather than just controlling like the little content area or what goes in your sidebars, everything from the top header to the bottom footer, all of that is included in a layout. And it gives people the ability to sort of drag and drop things into place in a way that um, is a lot more intuitive than working with the block system. Um, it also has a lot of the complexity of panels. So if you want to use it in a simple way, you can. But if you want to start creating different variations of stuff, um, it's all just sort of like a step farther than you went before. You can reach it. And there's lots of uh, flexibility in there for people who are site architects or non-developers um, to build exactly what they need, which is great. Uh, configuration management is something that's also really different from Drupal 7. This is also a feature that's in Drupal 8, 9, and 10, uh, where we have essentially allowed a separation between what was your content or your data and what is your configuration or your settings. And that means that if you have an active website that's getting lots of blog posts or comments all the time, you need to deploy a change that includes some configuration changes. You can do that now without needing to like log into the site and like edit something and save a form. You can just sort of push all of your code and your configuration at the same time and roll out a new feature without needing to worry about stopping any of those comments or content coming in at the same time. So it makes deployments a lot easier and a lot simpler, easier to manage. Um, and it also allows you to do things like import all of your content to a site that's under development and not have to worry about any of the stuff you're developing um, being um, interfered with, which is really great. It's a huge time saver uh, for people with just maintaining sites in the long term, which is great. And, you know, Backdrop has had three releases every year for the last 10 years, and every one of those releases includes a handful of new features. Some of those new features are old features that used to be contributed modules that are now moved into core and some of them are brand new things that um, we feel like are going to be valuable to at least 80% of sites uh, running backdrop and so you know this idea of keeping things backwards compatible is not stopped forward progress the idea of working on the Drupal 7 code base is not stopped forward progress there's a whole bunch of new stuff in um, backdrop core that you're uh, not going to recognize from Drupal which is great Um, I've just got a couple of quick visuals here. Um, Jen talked about the uh, the layout system and how that um, is changed from blocks and context in Drupal 7. So the, the screenshot here that you can see um, is the, uh, the blocks page from a Drupal 7 site. And I just sort of took a, a screenshot of a sandbox site here to give the memory of it for those of you who've seen that page before. 
where you have all the blocks that are anywhere on the on the website all in one big list and they can each have individual uh, visibility conditions on them but they're really just one after the other and you don't know which ones are on which page unless you go individually and and take a look um Drupal 7 also had the context module that that allowed you to, to do it in a granular way but it was also in my opinion in a fairly non-intuitive list form so um, that has become um, the layout uh, this is a, a screenshot of the layout page and backdrop um, and the the blocks that appear on this page can be dragged and dropped between the regions the regions show up where they are um you know on the on the front end so you have a much better visual of where things are each block can still have individual visibility conditions um but uh, so can in it, so can a layout so you can have multiple layouts and and you know an individual layout may apply to a, a subsection of the website and then you can customize all the blocks that show up there and see you know mainly just the blocks that are in that section on the layout um and then you can have another completely separate layout um, that's used for a, a particular content type um, so that anytime someone's viewing a blog post or a you know a particular type of resource page view um, that layout would be used and you can choose a completely different um, structure for that you can you can even rearrange on, on a number of sites I've worked on you know the header um, is completely different and you have like a subsection of the website with its own layout for a particular program or um, um you know section that that has different branding and, and everything um so it's it's really powerful and, and i think the the point that you can use it in a simple way or a complex way uh is is a good one um you don't have to take advantage of the complexity if you don't need it but you can if, if you need to So this is a screenshot of the configuration management user interface. Um, configuration is stored in JSON files on disk, which also makes them much faster to read than coming out of the database. Um, it uh, also is a format like the JSON syntax is something that almost all web developers are already familiar with. And even though this is all you know, syntax is handled in specific format of files on disk, we provided a user interface so that you can easily tell like which files are changed. And we also provided a visual difference so that if you make a change to one file, you can specifically see like which lines in that file are changed so that if you are a developer and you're interested in reviewing these changes before deploying them to a site, you have an interface that allows you to do that. So if you want to manage your um, configuration code in version configuration, <laughs> inversion control, you can do that. You can do it with Git. You can handle the syncs through the command line tools. Uh, but you also have a user interface where you can do it if you're not interested in using um, version control or command line tools. Um, and this is an example of where we don't assume a specific uh, level of comfort with something like command line tools in order to be a developer for Backdrop. You can do it all through the user interface. So almost every tool that we have um, has a user interface that can be used by um, site architects or administrators of any level. And uh, as was uh, hinted at earlier, there's uh, each of the releases, there's various improvements that come in into the, uh, the user interface. Um, and the, the particular screenshot here is just one example that came to mind and I took a, a quick screenshot of um, there's there's a built in uh, image library browser now that if you're working in the uh, CK editor window, you can hit the image button and then browse the library or upload images that go into the library. But it also ties into image fields so you can have you know sort of cross reference images between the. Uh, uh, the editor content or the image field content, which is which is pretty nice. Um, but there's there's a whole host of other improvements, and I'm not going to be able to list them all. But um, you know, some some other ones that I'll just call out briefly are uh, project browser, an installer, an upgrader that can all be done through the um, the interface. Now you can you can search for modules that are available. You can click to install them. Um, if there's upgrades available, you can do the upgrades through the interface, including Backdrop Core, which is which is really a, a cool improvement um, if you're hosting a closet. Um, and uh, the, there's an admin dashboard that sort of gives you a, a summary view of um, uh, different content, the content types or the, the vocabularies and that kind of thing. 
Um, the admin menu has been um, really improved. It's got the, the icons you can see in this screenshot as well. And uh, a little further off to the right, there's a menu search that you, if you, if you know what you're looking for, but you don't remember where it is in the menu, you can just use that to, to uh, start typing in what you're looking for and it'll show you where it is. Um, and many of the improvements are just uh, little improvements of putting things where you would expect to find them. Um, one example is uh, obviously we still have the sort of canonical permissions page where all the permissions are listed. But uh, if you're you know configuring a content type, there's also uh, a little block, a little section at the bottom that pulls in the the permissions for that content type. So you can change those while you're configuring the content type directly. Um, a variety of mobile friendliness improvements, uh, HTML5 fields being included in core, that kind of thing. Um, I put a, uh, a little request later later in the day yesterday on on the live chat for um, for backdrop, saying, "Does anybody have some some favorites of of the UI improvements that that I should call out?" And some of those are the ones I listed, but um, Clonos had a little phrase. I'm just going to read it quickly. He said, when people ask me about you know, the improvements in backdrop compared to Drupal 7, I usually instinctively reply with so many, it's hard to keep track. Um, what gets me every single time is how much I've gotten used to all the nice things we've added to backdrop over time. Once you start using backdrop, you start taking things for granted and get spoiled. Um, so many tiny changes here and there that are either not immediately obvious or they're simply how things were meant to work all along, um, which I think is is the goal. Um, so a good question we get all the time is who is currently running backdrop um the short answer to that is we don't necessarily know because they don't always tell us uh but based on who is active in our community we know that there are a lot of nonprofit organizations who are currently running backdrop we know that there are a handful of educational institutions that are running backdrop and we know that there are a lot of um, businesses and organizations who were on Drupal 7 and needed a easy next move. And that's um, that's what we've got. Uh, I know from my personal experience, I work on a lot of websites um, that are the business. So not necessarily a brick and mortar store that has a website that advertises it, but the, the website itself is the entire business. Um, and I find that that seems to be a really interesting fit for um, backdrop projects. Uh, I also work on a handful of nonprofit organizations with various different needs. Um, the Institute of Andean Studies is uh, on this slide. They are a local nonprofit that runs an event every year. They have a need for their site to be in both English and Spanish. They do a CVCRM database to manage their membership. Um, and all of that stuff is handled seamlessly by backdrop for them. It's been a great project. So getting to backdrop um, is different than if you were moving from Drupal uh, 7 to Drupal 8, but it is the same as if you were moving from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7. And there's some different terminology that we use through these two kind of moves. When you're going from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 or 9 or 10, it's called a migration. And that's because you start with the new site and then you pull in all of your data from the old site to sort of populate everything that you need in there. And this is something that was happening naturally in the Drupal cycle before Drupal 8 came around. There were a lot of organizations that would look at the cost of upgrading one of their Drupal sites and say, oh, well, you know, what if we just started over? <laughs> if you're looking at that sort of cost anyway, you know, let's start, let's rethink the whole thing. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of sites today that could really benefit from that. And from, for them, if it's going to be the same cost to rebuild or upgrade, then it doesn't really matter. Like a doing a migration is going to be comparable to doing an upgrade. Um, but for people who don't really want to build a new website and, you know, maybe most of the content they have is perfectly fine as it is, or the structure they have can be reworked, but the content itself is great. Um, doing an upgrade where you just take the old site and continue to convert it uh, makes a lot more sense. And so with Backdrop, we do upgrades from Drupal. We don't do migrations. Um, if you want to do migration to Backdrop, you could, but that's not usually what people do. Uh, and um, yeah, the two, it, again, is sort of a, a 
better match for what our audience usually needs in terms of wanting to do an upgrade instead of migration. Um, but there are there are people who do both. Um, so just I'm going to touch briefly on when releases happen. Um, just um, it's it's regular as was mentioned earlier. It's there's a there's a schedule of when the releases come out, and these are the uh, the minor releases. Um, the point of having the the schedule is that um, it's predictable. You know when it's going to happen. Um, and Backdrive has seen 25 on time releases like this since January 15th in 2015, way back then. Um, uh, so it's predictable, but it also helps to get the improvements into the software quicker um, rather than than having a, a lengthier um, time frame before before each release. There are a handful of uh, other things that Backdrop includes too. Laren mentioned earlier that there's a lot of um, mobile friendly improvements that have happened to Backdrop, including HTML5 elements. All of the pages are responsive out of the box. This is stuff that you know had been frustrating for people who are using Drupal 7, obviously, with the day we're in today. You can't have a content management system that that's not immediately mobile friendly, even our administration bar, everything works touch friendly, responsive and uh, accessible out of the box. Um, we include a built in rich text editor, just like Drupal 8 does. Uh, you saw the screenshot of the image library feature we have that is not the same as the media system that's in Drupal 8. We've went with a simpler approach that achieves the same goal, um, but still complete integration with our text editor, which works really nicely. Uh, views, the most popular module in Drupal 7, also included in core, same as Drupal backdrop. Again, a lot of the stuff is going to be the same for both because it's important for both projects. Um, configure, configuration and management, same in Drupal and backdrop. Um, a bunch of really common field types moved to core. Date, email, link, those are both in Drupal and backdrop core now. Backdrop also includes a handful of other ones like token, path auto, redirect, stuff that isn't in core in uh, Drupal 8, 9, or 10. Uh, file entity, this is something that we put into core um, similar to Drupal's uh, file entity and media solution, but again, less complicated, easier to use. A little bit more intuitive for new people who are architecting sites. Uh, media browser, again, we don't have media, but we do have a media browser. <laughs> so same solutions or same, we saw the same problem, but with a, a different technical solution. Uh, all of our administrative interfaces are now views the same way they are in Drupal 8. This just makes them infinitely customizable for anyone who's using them. We've uh, re- visited the way pages are previewed. They now preview in the correct themes. They preview different view modes. They preview on different screen sizes um, just to sort of solve all the needs you have today. So that's vastly improved over Drupal 7. Um, and there are a bunch of other um, little things like being able to register with an email address instead of a username, stuff like that, uh, all just included in core out of the box. There are a ton of uh, different types of add-ons that are available for Backdrop. We have modules and themes, just like Drupal. We have a third type of add-on called a layout. A layout uh, template is where your blocks would go on the page. So if you want to download a set of, I don't know, um, templates that use something like Zen Grids, you can do that. Uh, if you have your own set of layouts, different ones you want to use on your site, you can customize them and drop them into their top level uh, add on like a theme or a module because they're completely independent from the rest of your site, you can change your theme and where your blocks are in the page isn't going to change because it's controlled by the layout, you can change your layout and it isn't going to affect the way your theme works because the two are completely independent. And that's a big change from how things worked in uh, Drupal. We also have this uh, fourth add on type called a recipe, which is technically a module, but what it usually consists of is a collection of configuration files that when you enable the module will automatically set something up for you. So if you wanted a photo gallery, it would include, you know, content type fields, views, displays, um, slideshows, stuff like that could all be bundled together into that recipe and you can turn it on and it'll set it up for you. Um, and all it does is just install that configuration. And then if you decided not to use it later, you can remove the thing and it won't leave any muck behind. So um, different than I think what Drupal is using the word recipes for, uh, but still a very useful tool for backdrop development.
Of the top 100 Drupal 7 modules, um, we have moved many of these into core, and those are indicated from this graphic by the dots that are blue. Uh, the ones that are in contrib are the dots that are green. There are a couple of them that are black that we don't need it anymore for backup for various different reasons. And there are only a handful of the top 100 that aren't started at all um, in this list. I think there are four. Um, those include views PHP, which we're hoping not to get because it uh, represents a minor security concern, but I'm sure someone will need it eventually. We'll end up getting it. Um, and something like media YouTube, which we obviously don't have because we don't have a media system and backdrop. We do have YouTube fields and other ways to add YouTube videos to your site, um, but not a specific media entity for YouTube videos. We also have uh, more than 75 contributed modules that have been uh, included in core directly or have had their features included in core. Um, so for a module that gets included in core directly, that can be something like entity reference that just gets dropped in as a module you can enable if you want on your site. And then we have things like token that are no longer modules in Backdrop, but all of the tokens are integrated in the core system module, or things like path auto that have become part of the path module. So there's various different ways in which modules can get integrated into core. And then we have other um, uh, modules, something like block class, where that was a dedicated module in Drupal, but now in Backdrop, there's just the ability to add a class on every block built into the block system itself. So that isn't a module, it's just a feature that exists there. Um, so there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of the contribute modules for Drupal 7 you'll find aren't necessary for one of those three reasons. Uh, and we're hoping that this will help relieve the burden on um, maintainers for those modules, on maintainers for people who are running backdrop websites. Um, and having all this stuff in core means that it's got you know, automated testing and regular updates and accessibility concerns addressed and all of that stuff um, handled by the core development team instead. So again, hopefully trying to make things a little easier on people who are running backdrop sites. So there's uh, currently over a thousand projects um, in the contrib space for backdrop. That's uh, modules, themes, or layouts. Um, over 800 of them have official releases. The others are either uh, in some stage of development, I suppose. Um, and um, if you need a module that existed in Drupal 7, but it's not yet available for backdrop, many of those can be ported to work with backdrop uh, relatively easily. Um, and uh, if if you're a developer, you can you can easily kickstart a, a port with a, a, pro, a module, module called Coder Upgrade that does a lot of the grunt work for you, and then you can go through and and uh, see if it needs any other cleanup. Um, there's also an issue queue and a live chat where uh, people who who don't want to or aren't able to do the development themselves can uh, indicate their interest in a module and uh, request somebody to help them or um, uh, you can also hire a developer to, to do it for you and wrap it into your upgrade process if you uh, wanted to do it that way. One of the questions we get a lot with Backdrop is, uh, you know, what about security? How do you keep things secure? Um, and uh, I did want to mention that we do work tightly with the Drupal security team. We review um, issues that are affecting both projects together. We work on them together. We help with solutions for both projects and we co-release on the same day. Um, and that is true for both core projects and um, contrib projects. As long as we know about the issue, we will collaborate and get it done together, which is great. Uh, we also have our own security team. There are obviously going to be issues that affect Backdrop that don't affect Drupal and vice versa. And so we have our own group of people. We have our own process for receiving the security issues, managing them securely, coming out with releases, getting a, a, a CVE, which is like a number that identifies your vulnerability. And we're also currently working on becoming an authority who can issue those CVEs as well. Um, so we do have a lot of, uh, you know, we have a lot of experience in the security world from Drupal, and we also have a commitment to continuing that for Backdrop. Uh, our security process also works a little bit differently because our audience is a little different, where in Drupal, 
if you release a module, you become solely responsible for the security of that module over time. And that means that if you're not around to make a release uh, and there's a known security issue, your module can be become marked unsupported. Um, this means that anyone who's running that module is now going to be vulnerable to whatever the issue was with that module on their site, and they might not necessarily know what that is. Um, so they know they're at risk, but they don't know how to fix it. What we're doing in Backdrop is a little different where our security team works more closely with our maintainers to make sure that if there's a security issue, they're aware of it, they know how to fix it, how to fix it will help them fix it. We're going to guide them through the process of making a release. If they're not comfortable making a security release, we can do that on their behalf. And if there's no response from the maintainers, our security team is still authorized to create a security release for that project so that anyone who's running that uh, website using that module isn't going to be an increased risk for that. So we have sort of a shared um, more of a shared ownership of these contributed projects. And we're hoping that that will also help support our developer base that may not be professional developers by day. They might just be people who built their own website and built their own module and wanted to give it away for free. We want to encourage that kind of behavior. So we're going to give those people as much support as we can through the process. And likewise, there's a bug squad, um, which may not be security related, but may if uh, if a module isn't actively maintained and a, and a bug has been reported and uh, a pull request has been um, submitted, which fixes it and, and, and it has um, testing um, uh, by community members uh, indicated in the queue, after a certain length of time, the bug squad is authorized to uh, to make a release that that implements that bug fix as well. So um, I was hoping we'd end with a little time for questions, and it uh, looks like we have the, the links here um, show where you can find the Backdrop community. There's uh, obviously uh, code is on GitHub. There's a live chat on Zulip chat. There's also a, a sort of asynchronous forum if you're more comfortable posting something and then waiting for an answer for a little longer. Um, there's a website, a documentation website. Uh, Backdrop has accounts on Twitter and recently Mastodon. Um, and there's also community meetings every Thursday, live meetings um, that are uh, happening by, by Zoom. Um, you're welcome to any of these places. And uh, probably if you have a question you want to pose to the Backdrop community, the live chat would be a good place. You can also use any of those others. Um, and if you want to contact Atten, here's the, the form for Atten.